two. Welcome back, WNST, Tass in Baltimore and WNST.net. We're out at State Fair in Catonsville doing Baltimore Positive. Uh, episode two. Chapter three. Chapter three. Chapters are for books. Dr. Malia sure. Cromer from the Sarah T. Hughes Politics Center. Now, I'm going to, Nestor, he views himself as a historian, knowing all things. Folks out there listening, I thought, I've heard that Sarah T. Hughes, Sarah T. Hughes, and I thought, you know, I'm going to have Malia on. I, I should know who Sarah T. Hughes is. And when I looked it up, I thought, of course I know who she is. <laughs> Do you have any idea who Sarah uh, T. Hughes is? You know, this is where the civics part, where Don, <laughs> I, you know, you weren't available, available to me in social studies in ninth grade. So well, um, I apologize because until this morning, I should have known her name. I did not. That's bad on me. But Dr. Cromer, inform all of us why we all know who Sarah T. Hughes was. Sarah Tillman Hughes was the judge who swore an LBJ on Air Force One after Kennedy was oh, shot. Oh, okay. She's the I've seen oh, that famous picture. That's right. Yeah, She's sure. the very small. She was short in stature. She's a very small judge um, who, uh, who swore him in. Uh, she's actually featured uh, in the movie about LBJ that's um, on HBO. She has a sort of a, it's not a prominent role, but it is a part of the, she, they use her as part of the storyline. It was a judge that LBJ had advocated for to become a federal judge, and there was sort of some pushback against the Kennedys. Uh, but she was the only female currently to ever swear in a sitting president. And, and I believe that Damian O'Doherty and Len Foxwell, the only two listeners out there who had a clue who Sarah T. <laughs> Hughes was until this moment. All right. So, so I want to come back to Paul. Sure. Because one of the things, having lived this life myself for a number of years, that always gets folks, and I know particularly when you talk to candidates and you're trying to follow mm -hmm. a number of polls, they'll go, yeah, you can't, don't pay any attention to that poll. That's, that's Maryland voters. That doesn't matter at all. The only poll that matters is likely voters. If sure. it's not likely voters, don't pay any attention. Again, tell us, tell our audience, what in the world are they talking about? So, um... And again, it's this, this focus on um, with any sort of political poll, they want to do the sort of head-to-head -head horse race polling. And to do head-to-head -head horse race po polling appropriate, you have to isolate what you would call a likely voter. There is a bunch of different ways to do it. Um, it typically, it is done by a, f a, a screening method. So, you know, you start with one. Um, if, you don't, if you do adult population at large, which is what the Goucher poll does, you have to ask the first question, are you registered to vote? So anybody who's not registered to vote, drop them out of the sample. They don't get any more questions. You know, the next question is typically a question about interest in the election. How interested you are in the election? I individuals who say they aren't, aren't interested in the election, drop from the sample. Um, how likely, um, th or did you vote in the last election cycle? So individuals who vote, um, who voting is habitual. So if you voted before, you're more likely to vote again. And so those individual responses get typically a higher weight than the rest of the responses. And then finally, you follow up with a how likely are you to vote? And it's a, it's a scale. And typically, you add in a social desirability sort of element to it that say, some people are real, you know, sometimes people vote, but other times they just get too busy or things get in the way. And so they, they we purposely sort of prime the respondent. Just couldn't get there. They just couldn't get there. So like, it's not a big deal. And you so don't use voter rolls. So you can. So there's, there's RDD sampling, which is what the Goucher poll does. And then there's RBS sampling, registration-based sampling. Okay. And so there's, there's, there's sort of debates among pollsters, which is the best way to do it. I choose RDD, um, random digit dialing, because I, get, I, I believe it gives you a better coverage of the state as a whole and that you're able to get individuals, um, select people into the sample um, that perhaps are going to register to vote, that might, you know, that might, have not, not, might, might not have registered to vote yet. And there is a lag time between the voter rolls that you purchase to do the, R, the, the RBS sampling and the, so the current time. How many people really do register a, at the finish line? And I would um, think maybe next year, maybe more so given the state of politics that's very... You know, I used to travel the world in other places and, sure. and go other places, and politics would be a, a topic. Here, it's the last 10 years, it's become much more dinner table through social media. I have a feeling there's a lot of people that have been really yippy the last three years that maybe next year there'll be a little bit more of a rush to the fit to there, say, I want to vote this time for the first time. Sure, there and, and there might be. And so, so RDD would ca capture those individuals. But I think also, more importantly, when you register to vote um, – you can put a cell phone or a landline down, but you don't have to. So there are gaps in those in that data. And so if you if you th not everybody who registers to vote provides a cell phone or landline, and therefore when you do this sort of sampling of RBS, that sometimes there are sort of there's missing data. Um, RDD doesn't um, corrects for that. 
However, where RDD, the, the, the difference between sort of RDD and RBS is registration-based sampling, you're sure those individuals are, right. um, are voters. I'm positive. RDD relies on people self telling me that they are, and there is a social desirability issue. Like That's if I asked you if you were, if you were registered to vote, right? You're going to say, just, "Of course I was." Just going to ask you how That's you right. guard against that, because it seems to me that, that I love that term, social desirability. It's social desirability. I've not, I've not heard it described that way. It seems to me that when your nice little college student calls mm -hmm. and you've trained them and they're chirpy, and I'm calling from Gap, <laughs> I want to tell that student. Well, of course I vote. I always vote. How do you guard against that? No, and it's and it's the, sa the same issue with voting as you have about um, gauging things like racism. You know, you can't call somebody on the phone and ask them if they're a racist. On a scale of right. one to say, how racist would you say that you are? <laughs> right. right? You're not going to say that. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> would it be Archie Bunker <laughs> yeah. or Trump? Or where, where, where would you put yourself right. in there? Well, right, and so, so the, it, does ma it does make a difference. And people do tend to <clears throat> overestimate, um, uh, overestimate their likelihood of turning out to vote, I think, um, in, in some as as aspects. But the good thing thing is when you're start, but the screening typically does work and it's worked for us certainly at the Goucher poll in the past um what's the screening the screen so the screening method is like right. so are you are you registered are you are you interested in voting um how um, have you voted in the last election cycle um are, how likely are you to vote in this election cycle and it, it creates like a five-point scale where you're basically not likely at all to you know sort of i'm definitely going to vote doesn't matter what's going to happen i'm definitely going to vote and you found that people more often than not tend to answer honestly because I, your your results are validated the, res the res results seem to be validated okay. for me and, and it's not and listen I didn't come up with this methodology. This right. is a, this is a methodology that a lot of other public pollsters use, and it's something that I've been that I've adopted from sort of the other all the other pollsters out there. It's a pretty tr it's a pr it's a traditional way to do it. It's a traditional standard. Well, well, talk talk then, building on that, mm -hmm. talk about the state of Maryland. And again, well, as Nestor said, one of the t things we're trying to do is really engage folks in a way, in a deep and rich way, to look at the state, look at the city. Sure. We're all joined at the hip. I'm going to say that every time we do this, until people are sick of hearing it. Baltimore <laughs> and the surrounding, re we're joined at the hip. Please we're come all, back to Baltimore. We we're trying to fix it. Come back Thank to you. Baltimore. We love it's Baltimore City. It's not the city. wire, I swear. I go so, to yoga like four days a week. Right. I walk through So we month. love the city. But when you look at the state, and you, you poll all over the state, mm -hmm. um, break the state down for What do you find that... What, what unites Maryland voters, I guess is a way to say it, and then how are they different? Sure. I, I think that the, the lesson that I've learned after six years now of collecting data on Marylanders is that that old adage of it being the land of middle temperament is true. Uh, and that you look at across um, uh, identifiers uh, and the, a, a plurality of Marylanders identify themselves as moderates. Um, and then, I mean, they're mostly Democrats, right? So we have you, that two to one Democratic to Republican ratio. But way more purple than, than like, it's, I than it is when you uh -oh. put it on I CNN. I wouldn't call map. it purple. Okay. No, 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 no. no? I, but I would not call it purple. It is, it's, it's varying shades of blue. That's what I, that's what I would describe it. It is not purple. This is, this is, this is a Varying blue state. shades of blue it's with, a, with blue. a red governor? Gov uh, no, I mean, just Come because... On, I mean, I, I, that, that's, he, he well, that would be the contradiction that has us sitting here right sure. now, right? And he's effectively positioned himself as, a, as, as an independently minded moderate. He doesn't run as a Republican. Um, so, yes, he's a Republican, but... Uh, the governor, I think, by and large, has tried to find a, sort of that find that middle temperament of the state and appeal to that sort of crop that that where the most the, where if you look at the sample of where all the, the where um where Marylanders lie, he appeals to that sort of the large the the heavy middle. Does does Maryland? I'm I'm intrigued. But 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 that being said, so yes, and everybody Go always ahead. points out the Republican governor, but right. at the same time, they also sent a super majority again to the state legislature, and seven of our eight um are state uh are. Uh, no, in a country of democracy, my, we've elected a fascist, right? My so, I friend, mean, but like my I, friend, you know, that, my, that, but <laughs> not, but you know? in Maryland, again, and my friend Kevin Kamenitz, your friend Kevin <laughs> Kamenitz, uh, and you and he always had some interesting or interactions. But he used to say, in the midst of what's going on nationally, in the midst, don't forget, Maryland is still a state that elects uh, Barbara Mikulski, Ben Cardin, uh, Chris Van Hollen, sure, uh, with these large margins. So. But I'm going to go back to when you said, I loved, what did you say, Maryland? The middle temperament? Is that it's a land of middle temperament. Middle yeah, I wish I did not come up with that. No, no, <laughs> but I, I like that. And you talk about it being a moderate state. Tell us 
how that a moderate reflects, blue state. A moderate blue, blue state. state. How, so tell me what people in a moderate blue state believe. So uh, they they are socially progressive. So individuals in this state um, are going to be uh, progressive on social issues. But when you press them on tax and infrastructure related issues, you're going to see the so these these divides start to happen. Um, by and large, Marylanders believe that they carry a really heavy tax burden. That's thus the appeal of a sort of Republican governor who is focused on keeping a tax burden low. Um, and then issues such as infrastructure, you're going to see the natural divide between urban and rural voters, where urban voters are sort of more pro in investing in sort of public transportation infrastructure versus anybody outside the urban corridor. And, in, and even some of those folks inside the urban cor corridor are going to say that we prefer that we uh, put money towards uh, roads and highways. By and large, though, the, the state is is pleased with the direction things are going. And that's, a, I think, an interesting reflection of our divided government, that we have a situation where uh, you, you have a Republican governor and a, a, a supermajority uh, legislature, and people seem to like the direction. And so I, I Checks and balances. Well, well, I, I, and, I, and I credit, so, and I, and I uh, you know, Governor Hogan, for, um, for the, because he's governor, he gets a, a lot of credit for this, but it's also the Maryland General Assembly. The people also like the kind of leadership of the Maryland General Assembly. And if they didn't, they wouldn't like the way, they wouldn't reflect so much so heavily that they like the state, the way the state is going. Well, and it's a you, shared, it's shared. As, as you know, your, your response to that really answered Nestor's question to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, about Governor Hogan. Because when you talked about that this moderate Maryland, this middle temperament Maryland, sure. uh, mid-Atlantic temperament, the socially progressive, mm -hmm. or, or certainly not reactionary to social issues, and at the same time, fiscally moderate, moderate. to conservative. Now, h how much of that, Malia, is related? It was interesting in, in preparing for your visit. I go back, and I'm always fascinated by guys like Frank Luntz, who mm -hmm. uh, you know, has obviously controlled the talking points on... The Republican side. Yep. And now I know there are some counterbalances, other folks coming forward to try to take that same strategy on the progressive mm -hmm. side. And what we don't call it global warming, we call it climate, climate change. change. That's right. We don't call <laughs> it the estate tax, we call it the death tax. Death tax. So <laughs> that's that's what that's what people in your field have brought, right? That is that is a Something that we have done, <laughs> yes. and, and, and so that's that's right. And so there's a there's a bunch of different flavors of pollsters. So the particular flavor that I am, you would call me a public pollster. Um, so our goal is to sort of gauge um, a public temperament. And but as somebody who does this privately um, at for profit, or to the individuals who work for these politicians, they're spending some time doing some message testing. So they're doing the same sort of underlying sampling methodology. But they're going to ask, if you heard that Don Moeller was X, Y, and Z, right. would you still vote for him? And so they're going to test sort of like your characteristics against a hypothetical challenger. Um, and then from there, they're also going to recruit people to do these focus groups, who, which is a more qualitative uh, approach to sort of figuring out where voters are at on, on, on specific issues. Uh, the, uh, Hogan, the Hogan campaign, and to their credit, during uh, the last election cycle, and they talked about this, it was in the Baltimore Sun, that they had a, a large focus group of like 100 women. So they knew that that was going to be an issue, that they knew suburban women in particular were really turned off by the Trump administration, and they knew that being crushed by the gender gap would would would, would hurt his re-election re chances. So he spent time with a group of, uh, there, there, there was 100 women in this focus group that they constantly sort of came back to and asked them questions and asked them questions to see... So to, to see where the they were at. The pliability. The pliability. Sure. On, yeah, so every time that Trump did this, was it going to hurt, hurt the governor? And this is, I mean, these are, this is, again, so politicians hate public pollsters sometimes. You always complain about it, but yet you're still using the same sort of social science methodology. We, all, we that always come. Well, let, always let's, comes back. <laughs> we're, we're, you know, third segment, let's really now get to it. You're a city resident. Sure. Nestor's a city resident. <coughs> you care deeply about Baltimore City. That's why we're doing this. What? What does the next next mayor, regardless of who he or she is, mm -hmm. what do they have to do to hit the ground running, get this thing turned around? Dutch had some ideas. Curious, sure. and and it seems there there there's some consensus. But what do you think the next mayor has to do? 
Sure. I, and, and I go back to, to my idea that I think that they need to find ways to effectively figure out what, citi- what citizens want and not just what activist community wants or just not, just not just what neighborhood association presidents want and those groups to really try to, to figure out you know, where Balt- how Balt- what Baltimore- Baltimoreans identify as the sort of the major problems facing the city and, for, and, and some solutions perhaps that they would like to see or initiatives that they would like to see the city take care of. So what, what, are, what's, what does the average citizen identify as a sort of a core problem and and i think it's actually problematic so i'm i'm a white person from federal hill i've lived here for six years um i am not a long-term city resident in a major uh, an african-american a majority african-american city it's it's those individuals i think that we need to make sure um that their voices get heard because the, it, it they make up they make up the majority of the city and maybe this is my kind of pul- my pulse so this is your thought of uh, renting the city versus owning the city no, I mean I wouldn't put it like that. Don't put. I don't no, want to put no, it. No, I don't no, want to put mean, it more to my mouth. But, um, but, 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 but I think if you, I see that I live in Federal sure. Hill, right? Yeah, I, that's what I, I. I walk through Federal Hill, and I, I live. I live at the harbor, and I think I, I have always felt like I'm a guy that this is where I live, and I don't feel like I want to leave anytime soon. Hence, doing this, sure. right, and being invested. But I definitely see people that they're only there until they're ready to meet their spouse, make a baby, move out, or they're one foot into well, I'm renting and mm-hmm. you know maybe I would live somewhere else as opposed to, hey man, I plopped down $295,000 on my place in Canton with my roof and somebody got robbed down here and somebody got robbed there and I can't go out and I, I, I'm not leaving, sure. I'm entrenched. That vote gets the same as a non-vote two doors down that somebody's renting, right? And it's not that I think every vote should count equally. Uh, my argument is that we should, uh, the next mayor, I think, should really, uh, th- there always should be a focus, not just on those harbor-hugging districts and the, har- the harbor-hugging right. a- areas, that there a, a, a renewed focus. And, and, and I'm not, say, not, not to say that Mayor Catherine Pugh didn't try, or uh, certainly, um, or Mayor Dixon or Mayor Stephanie Rollins-Blake you know, certainly didn't do these things. But I think a continued or maybe perhaps renewed focus on those on the communities that have been disproportionately affected by crime. So for every robbery that happens in Federal Hill, there um, there is a murder that's happening. And so what's happening in our city right now is an American tragedy Um, that much that much of a murder rate happening. I mean, you see, it makes national news if 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 individuals are killed in other cities. But this type of death happens every single day. And so I just I, I would like to see that's my biggest thing It's like, let's figure out. Let's talk to the members in those communities. Let's effectively gauge the attitudes of individuals who live in those communities, and let's figure out what they see. So that, that, um, give them some, uh, give them agency, and figure out what is not just what the activists think, but uh, what the people think. I think that is that is really on target. It's so consistent. Nestor Dutch talked about public safety. We talk about it. Dan Roderick's been writing about it. Michael Olesker. and I think what people understand is it's not just one strategy. When you talk about mm-hmm. those neighborhoods, what I hear from you coming out is this passion about those neighborhoods that have such a rich history in Baltimore City. I, I, I kidded Dutch. I mean, as a little kid, I, I, you know, I spent a lot of time at six twelve. Allendale Street in Evanston Village. I mean, real strong neighborhoods throughout this city. And the, the thing that, that gets me going is I look around and I see, you know, if, if, if my grandchildren say, hey, let's walk up and get a snowball. Mm-hmm. We can walk up and get a snowball and sit out and enjoy the snowball and walk home. And it's a wonderful family experience. I believe that that's what every family in Baltimore City Sure. Once for their children. They want their mom and dad or their grandfather and grandmother to be able to walk to the corner and get a snowball mm-hmm. and not be worried about getting hit with a random bullet. And it, it, it seems like a complex, comprehensive issue. It's jobs. It's public safety. As Dutch said, it's even infrastructure. Well, the well, city here, can't be I falling apart. One more because, point. Let me, make, sure, let, me, let, me, let me make one more point. And I think it has to be. When we talk, and we talk about whoever the next mayor mm-hmm. is, in addition to all those things where the rubber meets the road things, it has to be someone who makes us believe again that this city can be great again. I, I always come back to the bully pulpit because I believe it matters. And, Nestor, I cut you off. Well, this, this is where the pollsters come in, where the perception and the reality, right? Asking people questions about what they think about it that's what they think. That's perception. And then the reality is, here are the dead bodies. Here are the statistics and here are the numbers. In your, so give me an example of a place or a study or a thing where 
<laughs> my study is this. I get off planes, and I fly all over the country. I fly all over the world, and I'm 50. So I've been flying for 35 years to places, and a lot of places I'm a repeat visitor. And I go back to the same place, space, restaurant, area, region, five years later, ten years later. And my wife and I always argue this male-female point-counterpoint where, you know, I look and say, well, this coffee's a nine or that thing's a seven. And you, you, you rank and rate. You say, is this place getting better or is it getting worse? And recently, I've gotten off planes in Cleveland where it's getting better. You feel it. You see it. Um, you, you get off a plane in Nashville. You see the growth. You feel it. You get off a plane in Charlotte where I've been going for 30 years, every five, seven, eight years. And I'm like, wow, this place has grown up. I look, look at this new thing down here. And this place looks vibrant. And it looks safe. And, and then I live in Baltimore. And the perception of it and the reality of it. And then where that bottom is and how it turns around starts with perception and then fixing it up and i guess in our city it's going to be law and order and and the perception of all of that so where do the polls come into all of that to be asked to gauge something that's going to be a part the new mayor is going to come in and find someone like you and say help me get data help me get information to turn this tide so i mean listen um my suggestion always is in a, a that people should care a lot less um, what somebody like me thinks sitting from Federal Hill um, and a lot Mm -hmm. more what uh, people think who live um, in areas that have been disproportionately affected by crime and poverty. Uh, And so the first... The first thing that I would suggest anybody do um, is they would they would start to build out a way to effectively and consistently start asking the citizens and residents who live in those areas um, a, an effective way for them to give feedback to the government um, on things that are actually happening in their city. So I think there's, there's a tremendous amount of things that are happening in those neighborhoods that we're missing. And I'm not sure what those things are, mm-hmm. but I'm sure that we're missing something. Um, and I think there's solutions, and I think there's intelligent people, and I, I believe very, very strongly in the collective wisdom of the masses, um, that together that there are solutions that the, the city has not thought about yet, that they could certainly help to get there if they started to talk, talk to these individuals more systematically um, in, those, in those neighborhoods. And that would mean going around and find, trying to find ways to build a sophisticated sort of sample of these residents who can give feedback through mechanisms that aren't just community associations. Nothing against community associations. I think that they're really great for a lot of different things. I don't think they're representative, uh, fully representative of the neighborhoods in which they represent. Well, people looking to government also are looking for competency, right? Well, so mm-hmm. one of the things that I know you quick, with, know with the county executive side, that when you call to pull a permit, when you call a police officer, when you call for public service when you show up because you need something whatever that need would be that can you get that done in the city and well well, let me let me pick up on that and and i think you both will relate to this this morning i was i was uh, i looked at uh uh, senator bill ferguson um had a, a facebook post and i'm reading it and my wife hears me go yes and she goes yes what and i said bill ferguson just captured what I believe is the essence, not only of Baltimore positive, but what local government should be. And Bill Ferguson had a story, I don't know if you saw it, where he, he reported on, he had gone to the new mayor, he had gone to Jack Young. And Jack Young had come to Annapolis, said, anything I can do for you, let's, you know, let's see what we can do, let's work together. Bill said, well, i tell you what I think is really important, Mayor. He said, every year we seem late opening the city yep. pools. For whatever reason, all these thousands of city youngsters, when school lets out, are ready to go to the Didn't pool. Didn't Angelo make a donation we, a couple I, I, years ago that, to open some pools? Why? He may have. I, I, I don't, rem- yeah, I don't I, remember I, that. Yeah, I do, so I, I the do mayor, remember that. here's the important yeah. point that I think. We talk about Baltimore positive, and again, we're not looking at any individual. We're looking at big picture, and I think there's a big picture thing here, and that is the mayor says, let me look into that, Bill. I'll get back to you. He then goes back, and lo and behold, the mayor followed up. This is the William Donald Schaefer stuff. Went back, found out, making a list. He went (laughs) back and he said, we've got some of these issues. Senator Ferguson, I I want you to speak directly to our folks in public works. Let's make sure these pools open on time. And that goes to what Malia is saying. In these neighborhoods, that makes the city work. The city is a better place if those pools should be open on time, yep. and by golly, those pools should be open on time. Because I got news for you. Come Memorial Day, the pools in Catonsville you know and the pools in Towson will be open 
on time. That's in my neighborhood too. And so Bill's my representative or my senator. And um, that, that, that pool is probably yeah, maybe like four or five blocks from my house. And it was really sad last summer to walk by and see, ah, it's not filled up, it's not filled up, it's not filled up. And finally... There you go. And it's and it's it's full right now. I, t- I, I posted on that same post, and I was like, Bill, so the pool is full. I mean, you don't want to get in it right now, but it's th- full. <laughs> this is what we're going to do. I know we're running out of time. Malia, we don't let any of our guests okay. come in <laughs> without without throwing them in the deep end and saying, let's let folks know a little bit more about you. Gosh. So when you're not polling, when you're not out there at the Sarah T. Hughes Center, when you have any – what does Malia Cromer do to relax? I know, and this is like – because I'm really not that interesting of a person, and uh, <laughs> I, and I – and uh, yeah, so um, I have a small dog that I spend a lot of time. I'm married. Um, his name is Mike. My husband's name is Mike. My small dog. Hi, Mike. Hi, Mike. <laughs> um, my small dog's name is Porter. She's like a Yorkie mix of some sort. Um, I kn- are you a movie person? I'm a, I'm an avid TV watcher. No. What do you like? What do you watch? Uh, Game of Thrones. Game oh, of Thrones. Is, t- yeah. We have nerds. Nestor and we I think are the, you, I think you and I are the only two people no, right. who have never seen Game of Thrones. My no. wife is addicted. <laughs> I love it. No, I think it, um, I I love Sierra. I think that we're still in the golden age of television. Um, Was I, that coffee or tea on the table in the Game of Thrones last? I week? have no idea. It doesn't matter to me. <laughs> Is it true? I heard the episode was you so sh- dark it was actually hard to watch. It was really dark. Yeah, I don't know. I, it, it doesn't <laughs> just matter. Love it's it. story. I, 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 I want to hear none of your criticism about it. Uh, uh, so. How about I don't music? Know, I don't have any criticism. What do you, what do you punch in the car when you're listening to music? When you're stuck in the traffic oh, coming over here? I'm podcast more more than oh, music. Okay. Than po- I'm so. But uh, if you do music, what do you do? What's the last concert you saw? Oh gosh, no, you're. I don't. This well, is a. Um, well, go, come on, it's okay. No, I want to express a really probably unpopular opinion. I feel like you're going to get really upset with me. <laughs> um, uh, As you sit under Prince and Frank's uh, app. Yeah, <laughs> I actually don't care. There you go. Like I, I, I you're not yeah, a music person. I'm not a music person. Um, well, matter of fact, and I, I will tell you, this is this is the God's honest truth that um, if I would go to a bar, which I really don't anymore, my homebody, but um, and if I would see live music being played, I'd make my husband leave. There you I go. don't want to hear anybody's live music. It. I, I, see, I'm going to say the same thing to you that I would say to Peter DeLuise Sorry. when we go to great places like State Fair, and he's like, uh, I'll have the hamburger, the hot dog, and the french fries. And I'd be like, dude, you, you got to enjoy it. They have some other things. You know things. what I mean? There's they have Brussels sprouts here. here. You, you're, you're missing out on the good <laughs> no, stuff. No, I'm not. I'm cool. Right. I'm absolutely fine. Real, I, real, I, I'm, no. real quick, this jump back. This is what back. I want too in my loud. pollster. Real, I want real too loud. focus in my pollster. Real, real quick, <laughs> podcast. What, what podcast are you listening to now? Uh, my favorite par- podcast is called The Bulwark. Um, it is by Charlie Sykes. Nestor takes notes. He likes um, all this. Yeah. yeah, so he's a um, he's a part of the sort of like ha- like the Never Trump Republicans. He's a former. Uh, I think he was a he was with the the the, the Weekly Standard before it kind right. of went under. Um, so the Bulwark, I think, is a collection of really smart sort of center right commentary, and I think it gives a really clear view. Um, the the cl- I think it gives a really kind of interesting and clear view of the political landscape. They're not really beholden to Democratic interests, so they're not like full resist, but they're not sort of Trumpian either. And so I, I think that space, the occupied space of the center right, the, the bulwark, the bulwark, the yeah, bulwark. the okay. occupied space of the center right, um, right now is an interesting, uh, an interesting perspective in American politics. Um, uh, so I listen to that a lot. Um, we may have to have you back. To, to talk about that, talk about your own podcast. It was roughly, oh, yeah, roughly, roughly speaking, speaking, government edition. So um, Luke Rodwater uh, from the Baltimore Sun and I, uh, one day we talked, we said, you know, we should do we should do a, a limited series podcast during legislative session. We'll interview delegates, um, inter- interview senators, and just get like the the whole sort of Stephen Colbert, like the better right. know a district thing. Right. And so I was like, we should better know a state legislator. This would be really fun. And so Luke and I did 13 episodes um, during legislative session. Now, the, that's the Baltimore Sun's. How par- long are your pods? Oh, gosh, not this long. <laughs> I'm, I'm being serious. No, same. You do about 20 or 30 minutes. So this, that's that what this will learn. be. I know, I know. I just I'm just saying this is like twenty or thirty minutes. Right, that's what that's what we're trying to do here. <laughs> you'll, so you'll get there. We should mention to people that Luke is the one that broke healthy. Did he break that while you were working on the podcast? Yes, healthy so Holly. Luke is um, like a machine. I don't right. understand like how he functions. Like he, uh, I worked at the Baltimore Sun in the late '80s, late at night when David Simon was coming in off the streets. Yeah, so I knew him as a kid. And I, in the modern era, what you need to do to break a story that doesn't want to be broken, whether it's Mueller down to sure. whatever corruption. Holly, yeah. and, and this isn't the only, you know, there's a, you know by the time this so, airs, there'll be another corrupt something, something, but journalism is how all this happens. So he was know? doing so that. He, he was doing that like in the midst of 
writing the the daily like what's going on the what's going on in the Maryland General Assembly. Right. Like he was still doing that beat reporting every single day. He was doing the podcast with me once a week, um, and then he ended up breaking this really huge story. It's just it's amazing. It's amazing. What did you learn about podcasting by doing that it's hard? Podcasting? God, that your jobs are a lot harder than mine. That it's a lot <laughs> harder to ask the questions than to answer them. That like that became real. It was really difficult. Like so, I had never been. I had always. Since I came to Baltimore, people were all, have always been asking me questions about, like, the poll. And I can easily answer questions about the approval and disapproval and all that stuff in between. Um, but I'd never had to ask people questions before, and it's super hard. What did you learn about the legislature? <laughs> wow. What did okay, you learn wow. about the okay. General Assembly? The, What's your takeaway after doing take this after for doing one it? session? The people were quite lovely, and, and maybe this is like a rosy view of the mm -hmm. world, but um, that I got to talk to a lot of really interesting people, and I found something that I liked individually about every, from every single person I talked to. I walked away with a new appreciation for the work they did and more new appreciation for them as individuals. And I think that we have a tendency to sort of like paint people um, – is you know Democrat or Republican on the good team or the bad team or vice versa or whatever you think, um, but once you meet the individuals, you realize that um, most of them get in the business of being a part-time state legislator to do the do the do good for their constituents, and most of them have that focus, and it was really nice to hear. Well, you know, it's a perfect place to stop because it's it's so positive, and I, and and I was struck by I went to your <laughs> web page, okay, and I was struck by the pull quote where you said, "I believe in the collective wisdom." of the American people and the power of state and local government. I do. And it sounds like that came through. <laughs> You're an optimist. See, I thought that until this guy got elected. I was, I was going to cut you up. You said that quote. Like, that, that's one of your... your you I know, believe kind of, in the collective Obviously, it's a wisdom. core belief. You've said it. Yeah. And I was going to stop you at that point and say, I always did, too. You know, I thought there was a reason George Wallace didn't show up in the White House. Sure. You know, that, that's the way I, I really... I felt like the whole time this thing was going on three years ago, I mm -hmm. thought... You know, I, I know we have some, some uh, yeah, I, I use some terminology sure. I can't use, so, you know, some a-holes in our society, uh, but I didn't think that, that a grand majority could allow what we've seen happen. So, so I think that there is a little shake in this that certainly Don and I have felt, um, people of our uh, ideology and sort of normalcy have felt to what is going on right now. One person for me, even if that person's president of the United States, doesn't shake uh, my faith in America and the underlying sort of values of um, the American democracy and the representative democracy. And so at the same time, um, at the same time that I think I, could, I, I understand, I can understand why people look at the president and th their sort of their, their trust in the collective wisdom um, is shaken. Um, I look at the individuals that were elected in Maryland to serve and I think that, I mean, I'm one of the people who probably, if asked, would say the state is going in the right direction. And I think that's because we've elected a group of individuals um, that seem to be, have the best interests of Marylanders at heart. And then I live in a that's, city. That's, I tell you, I that's, the, the, no, no, no. And then the mayor, you know, what you just said, by, by far, and Don always sure. argues, because I would sit on the radio 15 years ago and say, these politicians yeah. suck and these politicians are crooked. And Don it's would say, no, 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 no. Just not it, true. It's, it, it's like saying all these ball players are just entitled and these are, that's not true either. Right? That's so, you know, want, right? Yeah. So, that's, it's a so, perfect place to stop. The right. optimistic Malaya Cromer, this is Baltimore Positive. I like it. Episode two <laughs> has you. been terrific. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah T. Hughes, Center for Politics. F Field Politics Center. Field, Close po enough. Field it's okay. Politics it's a, it's Center. It's a mouthful. Thanks. Hope you'll come back. <laughs> Thanks, Don. Sure. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I'll go decaf the whole time next time. Okay, Lee, great. State <laughs> Fair, Catonsville. Baltimore Positive. We are WNST.net, AM 1570 at WNST, Towson, Baltimore. We never stop talking. Baltimore Sports.